and welcome to Always Take Notes. A message from our sponsor, Arvon. Do you have a story in you or want to test the waters of writing poetry or non-fiction? Maybe you already write and write well, but would like to try a new form or genre, pick up some new tricks. Enter Arvon. Arvon runs a yearly programme of in-person and online events. From five-day residential writing weeks that take place at one of its three writing houses, to a flexible online programme, featuring five-week online evening courses, masterclasses, and pay-what-you-can events. Arvon's courses cover everything from fiction, non-fiction, and poetry, to screenwriting, and even songwriting. They've been running creative writing courses up and down the UK since 1968. In that time, their prize-winning tutors, many of whom may be some of your favourite writers, have unlocked the creativity of over 100,000 people. Many have gone on to be published authors and career writers themselves. But actually, it's not about that. Writing with Arvon is about finding a supportive community of fellow writers, making like-minded connections that last a lifetime. By signing up for a course, you don't just get an acclaimed author as your tutor. You also gain a writing group to bounce ideas off long after the course is finished. So whether it's a cosy stay at one of their writing houses in Devon, West Yorkshire or Sleepy Shropshire, or a course you can do from the comfort of your sofa, Arvon works around your creative life. Visit arvon.org courses, that's A-R-V-O-N dot org slash courses, to learn more and give yourself the gift of writing. Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, we speak to the novelist Harlan Coben. We spoke to Harlan about his prolific career as a thriller writer, about his current collaboration with Netflix, and about his latest novel, Think Twice. It's a great episode. We hope you enjoy it. Welcome, Harlan, to Always Take Notes. It's fantastic to have you on the show. Could you kick us off with your new book, Think Twice? Tell us a little bit about Myron's latest adventure. Uh, Think Twice, the idea actually started with me when I read an article about uh, serial killers, uh, believe it or not. Um, Weirdly enough, we have less serial killers now than any time since they started recording it in the 70s and the 80s and 90s, not because we are mentally healthy or Lord knows we are not. We are as crazy, if not crazier than ever before, but it's really hard to get away with it now Um, because of phones. Everybody's got a phone. The the hitchhiking is over. The uh, you record it 8 million times a day on CCTV. So it's just very difficult to get away with it. So in my mind, I was thinking, hmm, how can I get away with it? And I don't like serial killer books. So I thought I'd bring back Myron and the gang and open up with um, in the very, very beginning that uh, the, the FBI comes to Myron and says, we think we have uh, this killer, but it's a friend of yours who you eulogized and died three years ago. Um, so how could it possibly be? Is he still alive? Is he dead? And what's going on? And that starts the ball rolling for Myron Wynn and the rest of the gang. And we saw that um, when you initially created the Myron character, you said he began as a kind of wish fulfillment, that there's overlays with with your own experience, but he was better at basketball and and so forth. But also that that the characters have kind of divulged and you said that you're you're jealous of each other. Is that still the case? And how does that fit in with Think Twice? Um, Yeah. So when I created Myron, I, I did it, like you say, writers don't necessarily like to admit it, but he was sort of me with wish fulfillment. He was faster, stronger. Funnier, he could think of that great line that I couldn't. Uh, braver, better basketball. I hadn't beaten two areas. One, I was a, I'm a better dancer, which we can't demonstrate. Thank God, on podcast. And the second thing was, I was slightly wiser in the ways of women. This is not like two great shakes. It's sort of like saying syphilis is better than gonorrhea. We're not talking geniuses here, but um, I was slightly wiser in the ways of women. But I created a tension between us, and I don't know if I did it intentionally or not. But looking back on it, I hope I did. Um, one is that Myron has what I want in life and I have what Myron wants in life. So Myron's whole dream in life is to get married and move to the American suburbs and have 2.4 kids in a garage with a basketball hoop hanging over it and barbecues in the backyard with his family. And so I can't give him that. Um, That would make him happy. And I have that in my life. So Myron is envious there. Um, On the other hand, my parents died quite young. I miss them greatly. Um, And so I thought it'd be interesting in 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 a series like this with, with a, sort of hard boilish detective that he would have great relationship with his parents so myron's parents get to age and change and they're in their 80s as this book opens up um and the experiences that myron goes through is what i imagine would be happening had my my parents survived and so i'm jealous of him on that account he's jealous of me on the other account and i think that that tension has made the books better 
than they would have otherwise been. How has the character developed over uh, the books that he's been in, and, and particularly in Think Twice? How is he challenged by this accusation about his friend and client? Well, I started the first Myron book is almost 30 years old now. So I started Myron, and Myron's aged slightly slower than we have. So in the first book, Myron was probably around 28, and he's probably nearly 50 now. I'm not very specific with his age intentionally, but I do want him to age and change and grow. And it's not so much as I realized when I've written it. I, I also write the books in present day. So this book is 2024. It's not 2018. It's not 2012. It's 2024. And so the world has changed. And so the attitudes that you have toward it have changed. Things that were funny in 1994 when I wrote the first Iron book are not funny in 2024 or vice versa. Um, not that I'm going to be politically correct or change them in that way, but my attitudes have changed, their attitudes have changed, the world attitudes have changed. And so it's always a question for me of how much is Myron changed and when changed versus how much the world changed. How much do any of us really change versus what the world does? We're always told as fiction writers, oh, you know, your character has to change during the course of the book. He has to be one thing in the beginning. He has to be another thing at the end. And frankly, that's nonsense. Um, whatever your favorite stories are, I guarantee you, your hero did not change. He may have overcome something. He may have learned something from it. But for the most part, um, we don't change. And that's, some, that's something that I try not to force on, on a character. We saw you commented elsewhere that the fact that Myron is a sports agent was kind of incidental. You said, you know, you're not a huge sports guy that was just his job. Again, has in, you know, in the time you've been working on that, has that developed or is that a, a constant as well? I, I think it's a constant. When I started the books, I thought it would be a good hook, number one. You know, I was not a, a big selling author. My first Myron Bulletar novel sold for $5,000. And uh, to give you an idea, I don't want to brag, but by the fourth Myron Bolotar, I was up to $6,000. So it wasn't like an overnight success type of story. But what I did like about the sports world, I don't care who wins. I don't want someone to score the winning goal or any of that sort of a thing. But why we care so much and the microcosm for society, like, you know, we, we take these young kids and, and, and raise their fame and give them tons of money and we expect them to act rationally and we don't act rationally around them. Why do we care? I mean, it's not like, you know, Manchester City's coming to my job and cheering me on. Why do we care that they win? And so this was something I thought was interesting to explore. And I did that for a couple of books in the 90s. Now Myron is an agent. Uh, I thought he changed the name of his agency from MB Sports to MB Reps because now he represents ath or everything, uh, actors, whatever I want that world to be because I wanted a bigger world. And I didn't want people to think these are sports books. They are definitely not. And how do you find the experience of writing a, a book that's part of a series versus your standalone novels? I, I think in a previous interview, you likened it to having a painting where some of the parts are filled in. Um, and in some ways, that's helpful. In some ways, it's not. Could you kind of unpick that idea for listeners? Sure. If I'm writing a standalone novel, which is what most of my novels are, and if you watched Fool Me Once recently on Netflix, that was an, a standalone novel. I'm starting with a completely blank canvas. I have no idea. I'm facing that 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 where I'm going to go. With Myron, I look at it as a much larger canvas and some of the stuff is already filled in, but that stuff that's filled in, I really love and inspires me in a, in, a, in a different way. The actual writing process is pretty much the same. And I always think that a Myron book is going to be easier to write because I already know Myron. I already know the voice. I know Myron. I know Wynn. This book has actually three, first person, Wynn a little bit. Most of it is third person, Myron. Some of it is second person from the killer's viewpoint. Um, but it never gets easier. I always think it's going to be easier that way, but it really isn't. And could you tell us, using the example of this book, how you know writing a book or your latest book fits with your numerous other commitments? So your work with Netflix, these other arrangements with streamers and broadcasters. You, you're working on a on a year time frame, but how you know when when and what are you doing what during those twelve months? This is the first time I, I don't want to use the word late because I saw it coming very early on that I was not going to finish the book in time for the usual March release. And so we moved it to, to late May um, just because of the commitments from other, from TV series and, and the other stuff that I've been, that I've been doing. Uh, but my day job is writing the books. Um, the books are better than the TV. They mean more to me. Um, it's a more of a one-on-one -on -one relationship. I, I love the TV series. I think they're great, but they're a different 
they're very different stylistically um, and just different than the books. You can't capture certain things that you can. I enjoy reading more than I enjoy watching TV. But each book takes about nine months. I compare it to childbirth. The best part is the idea. Wink, wink, wink. Um, I hope somebody got that out there. And some days you feel great and some days you feel like there's a dumb truck parked on your bladder. And at the end, as the women have told me many times, you just want the dang thing out. Um, you don't care how it gets out. Uh, I'm a streak writer. I usually write the last 40 pages or so in one day. I wrote the last 40 pages, I think, twice in the 24 to 48 hour period where I'm just sitting right where I am now and I'm just banging away. And it's a great feeling. And I grow a playoff beard and some, you know, my kids will throw a banana in the room and run away because they don't want to bother me. And um, that's sort of what my process has, has always been. It's, uh, it's struggle and then bursts. I don't write four pages a day or something like that. I try, but that does never works for me. I am a streak writer. I think about it all of the time. And at the end, I write much faster as I get toward the ending. When you talk about that 24-hour, 48-hour period, how unbroken is that? Do you stop to sleep or is it just all the way through? Sometimes not. Sometimes It's it's a, it's almost a fever dream feeling. I don't want to – I hate when writers make things sound magical or whatever else, but it is just a – where my fingers actually can't move fast enough. Or if I'm writing those scenes by hand, which I often do, I can't make my hand move fast enough. I'm intentionally leaving off words on the first draft – or the he says, or the she says, or even descriptions, just because I'm flying so quickly. And then I can go back and fix it. One of the things people, every writer I know rewrites and rewrites a lot, and I'm of that school. I know only one writer who says he doesn't rewrite a lot, but none of us want to hang out with him. Um, so uh, I give myself permission to suck on the first draft, uh, and Lamott called it the shitty first draft. The hardest part of writing is to turn off that voice that tells you um, you suck. We all have it. I still have it. Stephen King still has it. Turn it off and still and write through it. Don't let it paralyze you. Let it fuel you. And remember the quote that I'm sometimes known for in terms of writing advice is, you can always fix bad pages. You can't fix no pages. We wanted to come back to the new book in due course, but can we roll back now to your early life? So growing up in suburban New Jersey, and we saw this comment that you'd said Writers always say, I always knew I wanted to be a writer when I was a three-month-old fetus, a pen formed in my hand. But you say it was a, a bit different that you started later when you were in college at Amherst in your 20s. Tell us, tell us about your, you know, your beginnings as a, as a reader and a writer. Yeah, I mean, I think if you were to speak to the people I went to school with, they'd probably remember me more as a basketball player than as a writer. I wasn't that kid who walked around with a book in his hand or and I don't know, I'm always a little suspicious of those sort of tales. You know, I'll always have a friend on, a, if I'm on a panel saying, oh, when I was five years old, the children gathered around me in the playground as I told them pirate tales. I'm like, oh, shut up. You got beaten up in my neighborhood for that. I don't, I just don't buy it. Um, so I came to it later, but I always loved the story. I, I told myself story. I thank God we didn't have the internet back then because I spent a lot of time and if you read my books, you can probably figure out. I spent a lot of time alone in woods, wandering aimlessly, lost. Um, and making up things in my head. I think today I probably would have filled it with scrolling through social media. So I thank goodness that wasn't around when I was a, was a kid. I read as well that there are a couple of incidents in your childhood, um, one about a kind of local mafioso and another about a, a schoolmate that was murdered. To what extent do you think that shaped your interest in kind of noirish stories or stories about uh, violence in suburbia and, and the kind of hidden depths of um, kind of idyllic suburban life? I think a lot. Uh, Flaubert has a quote where he says that try to be regular, orderly, and bourgeois in your real life so you can be violent and original in your work. And that's sort of, I, I mean, I grew up in a kind of a quiet uh, neighborhood outside of Newark, New Jersey. Um, and we had two rumors when I was growing up. One was that in, behind this big baronial mansion, you couldn't even see it from the road. They was protected by gates with stone lions at them, that a famous mafiosa boss lived there, and he actually burned bodies in a furnace in the, in, in the back of his yard. And the other rumor was that behind Riker Hill Elementary School, where there was no trespassing signs, there was actually a Nike nuclear missile base built into the suburbs, <laughs> surrounded by the houses uh, the normal sort of houses of Livingston, New Jersey. And when I grew up, I learned that both of those rumors were absolutely true. They both were true. And so I think that that idea that 
the the violent lives next to the quiet is is important in the work. You can't have an up without a down. You can't have a right without a left. You can't have a back without a front. And you can't really have dark without light. And so I always have a, try to have a lot of humor in the books. I try to show real life the, 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 the things that matter to us. In the case of Think Twice, I think it's really about the friendships between Meyer and Winter and Esperanza, about his parents and how they're aging and things like that. That's all in there. Real life is in there so that we can go darker. It's, you'll, you know, the dark feels dark next to the light. If you just dark, eventually your eyes get used to it and it doesn't, it's not nearly as interesting to me. And moving forward, we saw you were at college with Dan Brown. Did you, were you friends? Did you overlap and talk writing and stuff like that? We didn't. It's funny. Neither one of us knew we'd be a writer back then. Dan was more interested in music um, back then. I was uh, going to be, I was going to go to law school. So neither one of us were actually, I mean, we took some writing stuff, I guess. I actually didn't take as many writing things, but Dan and I were, knew each other. He was two years behind me. I also lived next door to David Foster Wallace, who might be an author that many of you are familiar with, with The Infinite Jest. Um, and I lived down the hall for, it's a, it was a sort of a weird, amazing time at Amherst. Did he already have the, the bandana on at that point? No, David was, it's actually kind of funny. Uh, David was a tennis player, David Foster Wallace, and he was more known for having like a sweater tied around his neck, looking very preppy. And I remember seeing him not a couple of years after school when all of a sudden he had the bandana and the jeans and all, and the flannel shirt and the longer hair. And I'm like, dude, what is this? Like, I thought he was putting me on for a little while. Um, so, uh, no, he was quite different, but he was also the smartest guy I ever knew. Uh, one of the stories I tell is I, in America, you make, you know, Amherst college at the time was a difficult school to make. We only had 420 kids per grade. And I made it more because of my basketball skill than my academics. That's how it is in America. If you, you know, the college wants you for a particular sport. So I was a little intimidated academically that I would, if I would be okay. And I was taking an introduction to political science class with David Foster Wallace. And I remember after writing the first paper, I'm walking back to the room with David and I'm, I got like a B on the paper. And I said, what did you get, David? And he goes, well, I got an A. I'm like, well, can I just read your paper? Cause I'm curious what an A paper was like. And I read it going, oh my God, I'm going to fail out of here. I've got, I don't only get a B because I'm not realizing that I was reading the paper by the smartest kid I would probably ever meet or hang out with. Um, David was that, and quite obviously that. So um, it was it was an interesting experience. Fascinating. Um, and obviously he maintained his tennis enthusiasm with his famous essay about Roger Federer. In fact, I was just at Roland Garros last week and I was just thinking about David when I was there. I was thinking about David when it comes to tennis, yeah. Could we also now talk about your experience on the Costa del Sol and how that uh, led to your first novel? Yeah, so my uh, this was 1980. 81, 82, 83, somewhere in there. Um, my family worked in the travel industry and I spent a summer working as a, when I was 18, 19, 20, around that age, much too young to be actually doing it. Um, I, I spent summers in the Costa del Sol of Spain, Fuenjarola, Tormolinos, Malaga, that area, um, taking care of American tourists. By the way, there was tons of you British down there back then. Still are, still are, yeah. I don't know if they still have those charters. And it was all, it was, um, I compare it for Americans, we have spring break. You guys had that summer break where all nationalities are down there. And it was a very heady experience because there wasn't many Americans. It was mostly Europeans. And I really didn't know what I was doing. I was in way over my head trying to take care of adults especially American adults who at the time were extraordinarily difficult on vacation. They were very intimidated by the idea of travel. Um, and so at one point while I was there, I actually thought I should write a book about this experience, about being an American, young American tour guide in Spain uh, during a summer. And that's what I did. I went back to my senior year of college and I wrote an entire novel, not taking any writing classes, never writing a short story. Spent the semester writing. I tried getting a teacher to help me, but really I was not in the English department, so there wasn't anybody. And I wrote the entire novel, and the novel is horrendous. It was terrible. It was pompous and self-absorbed and, and pretentious like most first novels are. But that's where I got that virus. I, I really liked the idea of writing. And then I decided to write what I love, which is what I call the novel of immersion. You know, I want to think twice to be the book you take to bed tonight at 10 o'clock. Think I'm only going to read for 15 minutes. Next thing you know, it's four in the morning. And you're sort of delirious because you've been reading up, all, staying up all night reading. Could you tell us then after that um, initial attempt, how things move forward and particularly with Play Dead, your, your first published book? And we're really interested in the podcast to hear about how 
writers got their first break. So how they went about getting representation, how they got a publishing deal. Take us take us back to then and nineteen ninety when it was when you were twenty six and it was first released. So uh, I wrote that first book. I think I and part of it I don't remember all that well, but I'll try to give you as much as I can. So I, I wrote that first book. I was probably twenty one or twenty two. I then wrote two or three novels that will never see the light of light of day. I think that's really important. I think that today we think that our first novel should be perfect and a hit, and I don't know why. To use a sports analogy, I get the talent of Michael Jordan. If I've never played basketball before and I go on the court, I'm going to get my butt kicked by everybody. I don't know why we think writing should be different because we can actually do it all. Um, so I understood even then that this was training for me, that each novel I wrote, even if I spent nine months on it, was the best training that I could get. Um, eventually with Play Dead, I think I was 24, I was 25, 26, so maybe it was two or three books later. And I sent it to a friend who was, well, a friend, she was a resident counselor at Amherst College when I was a student there. And I sent it to her, basically, um, she was working for a very literary house and the book was commercial, but I wanted her take if she could on it. Um, uh, and so she, she, I, gave, I sent it to her. I did not have representation at the time or anything like that. And um, a couple of weeks later, she called me back saying, wow, we want to move in a more commercial direction. This is just perfect for us. Uh, we're going to pay you $1,500 and buy it. And that was one of the happiest days of my life. So breaking in was actually not that hard for me. It was making the next step, having the steady career. Um, I, would, I would say I was ambitiously incremental, or incre I had incremental ambition. And that is when I first started, my whole dream in life, my whole goal was if I could just have one book published. That's all, just one book published. And it was like, okay, two. Two books published just to show it wasn't a fluke. Okay, if I could scratch out a meager living, just, you know, so I'm not completely pathetic. Okay, if I could just skim number 15 on the New York Times bestseller list, just for like an hour, just skim 15. Okay, if I could hit the top, and then eventually, oh, if I could hit one. So all of my ambition was always incremental and somewhat realistic. Um, it took a while for me to get there. My first New York Times bestseller was my 10th book. And again, not to be this, oh, kids today, but I get emails from people saying, you know, I've written a self, you know, I've written a book that I self-published myself. Why aren't I selling like you and James Patterson? Yeah. You know, it, it, it should take a while. You should be getting better at this, hopefully. Um, and you should be able to put the work in and, and want to do it and not, you know, publishers also are more difficult now. They expect that immediate hit um, or they move on. Uh, publishers were, were, I think, more patient um, when I was coming up. When you talk about those early novels that aren't going to see the light of day, um, can you identify, looking back now, why they didn't quite work or why those experiments were helpful to to kind of undertake but didn't cohere? I think that, you know, they're probably not as bad as I think. So I, I'll give you, when I wrote Play Dead and Miracle Cure, which were my first two books published by the small publishing house that I just mentioned, they went out of print. And for years, I would not let them back into print. I was didn't like them. Um, and then uh, the, uh, my French publisher really pushed me to do it. And I said, I'll tell you what, we can put those two back in print. But if we do that, I want to put a letter in the front, which I have. If you read the books now, you'll still see the letter in the front, which basically says, dear reader, these aren't very good. These are my early books. If you're a completist, go for it. But otherwise, I would put this book back on the shelf and start with something else, which I don't know any other writer who has done that before. My publishers were upset about it, but it's discouraged nobody. In fact, I think it encourages people to read it. But part of that is that I'm very hard on it, but we all are. Like if I ask both of you to tell me about your early podcast that you thought was so brilliant or your early writing that you thought was so brilliant when you were in college, right? And you find that essay now and you thought, wow, this is great. And you read it, you go, wow, this was crap. I was wrong. That's part of the same thing with novels where part of it is what did that stupid kid know back then? Um, but they're not necessarily, that's not necessarily fair. They are probably interesting in what they do. Um, but I was over the top. I didn't have, you know, there was, there was, there was a lot less, I think, subtlety back then. I didn't know, I, I just wasn't as wise. So I don't think the books are as wise, but then every once in a while I get an email that will say, no, no, play that's the best thing you've ever written. Stuff now is crap. So who knows, you know, you just have to put the things out there and, and sort of be brave about it. A question that we always ask novelists is how they go about constructing their plots so whether they in the vernacular that we have uh taken on whether they plot in advance or whether they just plunge in and we saw that you 
tend to know the end. Uh, and you mentioned this El Doctoro analogy about driving at light with the fog lights on. Um, but you know, tell us about about how that works. Where how much is pre-planned? How much stuff emerges along the way, and pieces like that. I usually have to know the beginning and the end. When I obviously get in the beginning, beginning I know the ending. So in Think Twice, I knew who the killer was. I knew where Greg Downing, his friend who supposedly died three years ago, was. I just knew that. I didn't know how I'd get there. I didn't know how I'd reveal it. I didn't know what would happen in Myron's personal life. If people watched recently on Netflix, Fool Me Once, that started with I, the idea of a woman sees her dead husband on a nanny cam. And then I knew, as crazy as that ending might seem, I knew that ending before I started. I knew it was going to happen to Maya, and I knew it, why that she saw that on the screen um, before I wrote page one. But how I get there, I don't know. I compare it to journeying from my home state of New Jersey across the U.S. to L.A. I may take Route 80. I may go via the Suez Canal or stop in Tokyo, but I always end up um, in L.A. So that's my method. I can, And I can see a little bit ahead of me by doing that as the E.L. Doctorow quote you mentioned. Um, it's like it's like writing is like driving a night in the fog with just your headlights on. You can only see a little bit ahead of you, but you can make the whole journey that way. I'm also a guy who looks for twists and turns. If you don't like twists and turns, I'm not your guy. If you want a sort of straight ahead narrative, I'm just not your guy. And that's okay. We can all we can both move on with our lives. It's fine. Um, but I love twists and turns, and I'm always looking for ways of defying your expectations, of taking something you think you've seen before. And and that's not easy in today's world. Here's my challenge. Um, and so far, it hasn't happened. You're not going to guess the ending of Think Twice. You're just not. And no one, I you may guess it, but no one's figured out really sort of the ending of Think Twice. But that's not enough for me. If you don't have the emotional resonance, if there's not a little bit of a tear welling in your eye when you read the final sentence of this book, then I feel like I haven't done my job. So I always want the endings to have, I'm, I'm always looking for both the twists and turns, but they have to have an emotional underpinning. It can't just be something that surprises you. It has to somehow move you. It has to be hit the heart, not just the brain. So if you think you've got the twist, you have to think twice. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> in as much as you can kind of analyze the art of the twist, um, could you kind of walk us through it? When you're, you know, you, you said that you kind of work it out as you go along, but once you're writing and you've come up with something, are you kind of 90% of the time confident in that choice or sure about it? Or do you go back and rework it? And how do you make sure that kind of once you're finished, everything adds up to the to the kind of finished picture? At this stage, I just sort of, uh, part of it, I go on faith. I know, I don't know normally, I don't, like, I don't go back when I'm rewriting and make a huge plot change, rarely. I don't think I've done it. The plot sort of flows. It's more the prose I'm working on and the dialogue and and... And that's sort of a thing and maybe adjusting a few things, but how I write it is usually how the time sequence is going to go. But I live my life, and I think a lot of writers do, with a what if in my head all the time. It's almost like those movies where, where we've seen now, they're, they're, kind of, they're getting uh, science fiction movies that you start seeing where people have alternate lives, right? I'm doing that all the time in my story. So I'm thinking, what else could happen here? Who could come in this room? How could I change this up? This feels a little too straightforward. What can happen that would be realistic and emotionally and emotionally arresting um, while writing this sort of normal scene? I try not to ever have a character who's just there to give information um, or just do one have one thing. And I try making each scene do more than one thing. One of the common questions we get, and maybe you've asked it on the show before, is what comes first, plot or character? And everybody answers character because it sounds good. And they all want to sound like they're impressive and they're not plot driven or commercial, but they're full of crap. They really are very much together. And the example that I use, let's take Batman or Spider-Man, for example. So Batman, the, his origin, as you probably know, is that his parents were murdered by a criminal uh, trying to arrest him. Spider-Man's is more interesting to me because Spider-Man, because of his ego, let a criminal go who ends up killing his uncle Ben. Now I ask you, are those plot or are those character? Well, the answer is both. Those are cool stories. And that Killer goes by him, and then we find out he kills his Uncle Ben, Spider-Man's Uncle Ben. Wow, that's a great story, but it also develops character. And that's how you should look at each thing. I think it's a real mistake, and writers make this real mistake when they think, ooh, I have to lead with character. What should be his background? Well, he had an alcohol problem in 1987, you know, that kind of thing. 
tell the story and through the story, you should be getting the character and vice versa. Once you start dividing that up, if I'm describing to you the setting where you are right now, the, the setting should tell me something about you as a person and inform my story began. Everything should do more than one thing if possible. And we try to divide it out. To, and a lot of times we do it to sort of sound good or sound like we are literate. It's a mistake. We are thrilled to announce the publication of Always Take Notes, advice from some of the world's greatest writers. The book, edited by the two of us, features contributions from almost 100 past guests on the podcast. It's a distillation of the wit and wisdom we've heard over the past six years. The book offers, we think, frank and entertaining guidance on writing in particular and living a creative life in general. It answers questions such as, where do the best ideas come from? How do you stay motivated? What does it take to become a published author? And how do you actually make money from your writing? Published by Ithaca Press, Always Take Notes, advice from some of the world's greatest writers is available now in all good bookshops. We hope you enjoy reading it. And in terms of physically where you are, when you're writing. We saw you had a stint in the back of Ubers. Uh, you've written in planes. You had a stint uh, standing by a bread counter so that you smelt of olives. I mean, what what is this kind of nomadism while you're actually working on a book? Where did that come from and what role does it play in your process? So uh, like you say, if you, if you ask, and you guys have, you ask 10 writers how they do it, you get 11 different answers, don't you? Uh, which is kind of fun. So like my friend John Grisham, has a little cottage behind his house. He goes to the same time every morning. He has no internet there. Um, that that hasn't worked for me. Part of it is also that um, it's a little different now. I have I have four kids, and most of my writing. In fact, the, the first day I hit the New York Times bestseller list was when my fourth child was born. I had a seven, four, two, a newborn in the house. So you learn to leave the house to write. Um, part of it was that to escape them. Part of it is that there's too many distractions at home. You will. Use any excuse not to write, which is the danger of the internet, the danger of having a phone nearby. But if I go out, especially back in those days when maybe my house had internet, but coffee shops didn't, it helped. Um, it, you know, otherwise I'll be sitting here, yeah, I'm going to write, but first maybe I should, you know, fix the sink that has a leak or whatever else. I'm a terrible handyman, but I'll do anything, anything to avoid the moment when you have to face a blank page or a blank screen. So leaving the house, putting myself in a different circumstance just helped with that. Um, I will change up anything, you know, you, you, like athletes will wear the same socks if they're winning. I'll keep doing the same thing while it works that I'm writing. And as soon as it stops working, I will look for something else. You used, mentioned the Uber example. So I got in the back of an Uber for the first time. It's when ride sharing was first starting. It was a book called The Stranger, which maybe some of you also saw on Netflix. And um, I felt guilty about spending the money to Uber into New York, but I was trying to justify it in my head. I took out my pad and I started to write and I wrote really well. So for three weeks, I took Ubers everywhere I went and finished that book in the back of an Uber. That magic never returned. So I stopped doing that and I had to find something else. And I'm constantly looking for something else. So I've gotten older now that the kids are grown and I have two dogs that really miss me when I leave the house. I am writing more and more in the house than I used to. You mentioned earlier that it, it wasn't a case of your career being an overnight success. I think it was tell no one where you kind of really broke out with the, with the broad readership. But once you had that success, that kind of widespread success, was it harder to write or did you kind of feel that you'd gained enough momentum by then that um, you kind of were in the right routine? I was very lucky that by the, you know, I've been on a pretty steady writing routine. I wrote seven Myron Bolotar books in five years right before Tell No One. And then I was going to be on a, a book a year thing. So when I finish a book, it's usually six months or so before the book comes out. So, so think, you know, think twice is out right around now it came out. I'm already a little slower than I used to be, but I'm already about page a hundred of the next book. I had finished the book after that gone for good by the time tell no one hit because it is a mind screw. Um, having success, you know, messes with your head. I can't imagine. And I was not a kid and I was only a writer. I, I can't imagine how these young kids who are become rock stars or big actors, it really can mess with your head if you're not careful. Luckily, I had four kids and, and a family and stuff like that and stability. So I know a lot of writers, um, they freeze up when they have the big hit. Um, I had already had the next book out and that helped. And I just, whenever I get stressed about things, whenever I worry about what's going on in the business or the world, 
I try to, the more I focus, the more I stick my fingers in my ear and go, la, 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 I can't hear you, and just focus on the writing, the better off I am. So during my career, you know, um, chain bookstores are going to destroy the business. Then the ebook was going to destroy the business. Then Amazon was going to destroy the business. Now, you know, I don't know what's going to destroy the business. And all I know is I'm not smart enough to control any of that. I can't, does, you know, I can't control chain stores or, or Amazon or anything like that. What I can do is make sure that my product, so to speak, that what I'm doing, my content is as good as it can be. So I try to turn off all of those distractions and write even harder. Because if my story is good enough, you'll read it on stone tablets. I don't care if you read it on ebook, audio, however you want to do it. I have to make sure that my story is as strong as it can be. And so, you know, you become one dimensional, but I think it's healthy for a writer to be a little one dimensional in that way. Another question that we put to everyone on the show is about money and how it's interacted with their writing lives. So be as, as candid or as guarded as you're comfortable with. But at what stage was it clear that you could make a living doing this? And at what stage was it clear that you could make a lot of money doing it? Um, making, well, first of all, um, I was extraordinarily lucky that my wife uh, is a pediatrician. Um, so that I was able, when I, I lost the job um, back in 1992, and so when my wife and I sat down and and we, I said, I'd love to give this writing thing a real chance. I'd had two novels published by then. And she was completely amenable. I, I don't know how people do it who don't have a spouse or partner who was supported, not just, not really financially, but supported in terms of, you know, wanting you to have that kind of success. And, um, so I, well, that's, how, that's how I sort of started doing it. And then I was able almost like I've mentioned before, I was able to scratch out a little bit of a living. Um, and then tell no one was life-changing overnight. It, it changed everything in terms of uh, the financial situation pretty much overnight. And I signed a, a new three book deal not long after it came out in 2000 and in the fall of 2001, that was life-changing. Um, and so that's, that's the answer to how it sort of happened. I was, you know, I, I it wasn't like, you know, I was kind of going like this, uh, uh, up straight up, sort of a straight up pattern. It was all of a sudden, boom, um, you were on a whole different level. It, it's part of the problem with the industry, I think, in some degrees. And this is true of most artistic endeavors. It's feast or famine. And the difference uh, was, was, was striking. We had um, David Baldacci on the show a few years ago, and he talked about renegotiating his kind of contracts and deals once he'd hit the big time to do more of a profit share rather than um, kind of royalties arrangement. Is that something that you've been tempted to do or have you kind of stuck to the same format throughout? I'm not smart enough to know what that is. <laughs> but Dave and I have the same agent uh, and I assume we're doing pretty much the same thing. Um, but, you, you know, one of the things, and this is this is sort of deep in the woods, that uh, writers are convinced they have to have, um, they have to earn out, they have to have their royalties have to make sense. And that's sort of nonsense. Um, so if a royalty is 10%, um, a writer really should be getting more like 30 or 40 or 50%. I don't know the exact numbers, but the publishing world kind of convinces you that you have to hit that 10% um, to earn out, and you really don't. Um, it should be, you should be getting a bigger share than that 10% uh, of your book. So they do it through advances um, and things like that. And that's how the system more or less works. Just to explain what, what David told us, because it is fascinating, is obviously that he he had a legal background, so he kind of knew how all this stuff worked. And he, when he it kind of went up an order of magnitude, he, yeah, stopped, completely moved off the royalty model and instead went to a straight revenue share model so that the, the kind of amount for the book was on the table. And um, there's then a 50-50 split between publisher and um, and writer. And the way he phrased it was in his view that no one should make more money from a book than the writer himself. But he was also open about the fact that like, you know, there were years of work that had, that had gone into this. Um, I just wanted to, to move forward now to the question of um, adaptation of your work. And we saw that there seemed to be, or you'd had a kind of changed perspective over time. So we saw this quote from 2003, where you described Hollywood as you drive into a desert with a barbed wire fence, you throw the manuscripts over, they throw the money over, you run and they run. But then, you know, and, and also that a publisher had warned you about Hollywood, mentioning Chandler, Scott Fitzgerald, Faulkner, the experience of it crushing writers. But then that you felt that Netflix worked differently. So you could tell us about that, I suppose, journey really from, from a, an arm's length arrangement to a much more collaborative arrangement. 
I, I, I earlier on in my career was trying to sell my stuff to Hollywood the way the same way we all all writers do, and we were always told not to get involved, and I think that was wise advice. When Tell No One became sort of a big deal, all of a sudden Hollywood wanted to fly me out to pitch meetings with people, and I remember taking a bunch, some very fairly well known names that wanted to hear what my next book was about, and I walked out of every meeting going, "Oh my God, they love it, they're definitely buying it," and then you would never get a phone call. And the wise publisher at the time, a woman named Carol Barron, who was, I was very, very close to, sort of pulled me aside and said, I'm telling you, you're going to get lost in that world and you're, you're going to forget to write your novels. Just focus on your novels. And I've learned in my life that if I focus on my novels, good things happen. If I don't, bad things happen in terms of, your, of my career. So I went back home and really said, I'm just going to dismiss that. I'm going to forget it. Every once in a while, I, I will sell it. Um, and uh, I still tell no one in the end, after being in Hollywood for a number of years, to a French director named Guillaume Canet, who made an excellent film out of it, um, which was just something that I felt, I just felt in my gut was going to work out better because I hated what Hollywood was sort of doing with scripts. It wasn't until I sort of became more comfortable in my position, and I had had a number of number one New York Times bestsellers, that I was more open to the idea of actually getting involved. Um, I, I always thought I could possibly do this and, and, and try it, and I found some good partners who I could do it with, and we had immediate success with it. And so success breeds more success, and that's what opened up that world where I was heavily involved um, in the adaptations. In the case of uh, your country, um, it was a lot with Nicholas Schindler, who ran at the time a company called Red Productions, now runs Key Street Productions, and Nicola is responsible for shows like Last Tango in Halifax and Happy Valley and Queer as Folk and all the shows that I've done. And we met, and she wanted to, at the time, uh, she wanted to buy one of my books, which that book wasn't available. But I said, I had this idea that I've been wanting to make in a TV show. And 10 minutes later, Sky had bought a Marlon Coben's The Five, as they wanted to call it. And we were on our way. Uh, and it's been a, a wonderful collaborative experience with Nicholas Schindler and Danny Brocklehurst and Richard Fee. I call it the core four. We've made the five, safe, the stranger, stay close, fool me once. And we're filming right now two more, Missing You, uh, which will be the next one on Netflix, and a show called Lazarus with Bill Nye and Sam Claflin, which we're going to be on Prime Video. Uh, so I was lucky to find them. And then other countries found it too. And uh, Netflix said, I sell more books overseas than I do in the US. Let's make it. I'm filming right now, Netflix Argentina. We did The Innocent Netflix Spain with a great director. We've done Netflix Poland. And it's been incredibly exciting and fun. I don't know if I would have been able to handle that 20 years ago. Um, I'm more confident in myself. And, you know, a writer spends a lot of time in a room. We, I am a socially adept introvert. But it's actually been um, empowering and energizing that I was just in Manchester not long ago. I was on set for both of the shows, Lazarus and Missing You, I mentioned. And I love being there, talking to the actors and the crew for three or four days. And then all I wanted to is get back here and lock myself in this room and start writing. So, you know, they feed off each other in their own way. So what have you learned during that process of how you turn a novel of immersion into a TV show of immersion? How do you make something gripping that's gripping on the page, gripping on the screen? The first thing is to accept that they're different. This is one of the complaints that I will get from my readers is, oh, that's very different than the book. And I'm like, yeah, it should be. The worst adaptations, I think, stay slavishly devoted to the text. When we were doing The Stranger, for example, in the book, The Stranger character is, is a male computer nerd. And so there's an opening scene when The Stranger drops this bomb on Richard Armitage's head about his wife faking her own her pregnancy. And visually, it just it didn't work with a, another guy. And I said, I was the one who said, I think we should make The Stranger female. I think we should make her sort of cool and hip. And we ha we hired Hannah John Kamen, who killed it, you know, killed it as that character and just was next level cool and you wanted to hang with. And that's what I mean. It just in a book, it's fine. Things work well in a book, but they don't necessarily work well on screen. So you have to be very, very open to making those sort of changes. Um, and it's just having a nose for a uh, story. The, the, the biggest difference is, is it's a collaboration. So I look at the TV series. So Fool Me Once, for example, when it came out, when we hit all kinds, we hit one or whatever else it was, we celebrate as a team. It's like, it's like I'm, I feel like I'm captain of a World Cup team. We just won the World Cup. I don't care who scores the goals. I don't care who makes the great pass. I don't, we, I, as long as we win, I don't care. And I want to celebrate. It's a great time to celebrate with everybody else. 
when it comes to the other thing, a book, well, I was just at Roland Garros. I feel like I'm a tennis player. I'm alone on that court. I may have a couple of coaches yelling from the box, but in the end, I have to win the match or lose the match. And I celebrate by myself and it's up to me. And there's sort of very, very different feelings. And I'm, I've been lucky that I've been able to experience both, which is, you know, I, I don't forget how lucky I am to be where I am. And this huge profile that you have in France, I mean, there's the adaptation of Gone for Good, but we saw that your agent had said that you are one of the biggest contemporary writers in France, period. When did that happen? And do you have any sense of, of what drove it? Tell, uh, tell no one. Uh, both the book, the book immediately exploded out there. I don't really, you know, other than being a, a book that resonated with people. I think it's, I think it's what I was sort of saying about heart before. Um, the French caught on early that it wasn't just a thriller with fast moving plot that, you know, that you really cared about those characters. And I think that's why they made it a better movie. Um, Hollywood, frankly, couldn't understand the idea. The story is a man loses his wife. She dies. She's murdered. And he can't move on with his life. In eight years past, he gets an email. He clicks a hyperlink. He sees a webcam and his dead wife walks by. Right? That's gripping. That's a cool idea. But Hollywood was kind of like, well, didn't he fall in love with somebody else in those eight years? Um, can't we have him having dating somebody else? Maybe three years instead of eight years? The French immediately got her. Francois Clouzet was just brilliant. Like He was just destroyed. So when she comes back, wow, it's such a moment. When he sees her on a computer screen as an actor, if you watch it, he do, and he won their Cesar for best actor, he doesn't overplay it. He doesn't gasp out loud. We just see it in his eyes that he can't believe that he has a chance at this sort of redemption. And romantics can under, understand that. Hollywood sometimes can't. Hollywood, Hollywood actually wanted to give him a girlfriend so that when she came back, it was a love triangle. And I was like, look, you can change everything else. I'm willing to change. You can move it to destination from where it was in New York to Paris as we did. You can change his job. You can make it different years. But the whole idea is that this man lost his soulmate and he can't move on. That's the heart. That's the heart that you, everything else you can change. And that was the part they couldn't quite grasp. Did you, you must have had to just laugh at that point. It's like the, you've kind of missed the entire point of the the plot. Yeah. <laughs> Look, every writer you've probably had on has their whiny story about Hollywood, so I don't want to necessarily contribute to it. I do think a lot of times the people have the best interests at heart. There's two things out there. Uh, one is I think there's a lot of self-deception. I don't think people are lying, but the odds of getting something made are so slim that they have to kind of lie and convince themselves that everything is going to get made out there, which is why most of the writers, 99% of the time that you have an option on your book, it doesn't mean anything. It's not going to happen, and you should kind of know that going in, but they're dreamers. You have to be a dreamer to be out there. But the second thing is, is exactly that is they, they start to question things too much. And so I remember how their mind frame actually worked. Cause they were sort of telling me, it's like, well, eight years, that's just too many. Can we make it three years? Okay. You can make it three years. Huh? And who's going to believe that let's say we get George Clooney. To play who's going to believe George Clooney didn't fall in love or meet somebody else in those three years. I'm like, well, anybody with a beating heart will understand it, but I get that you guys don't. Um, and so that was why. I had the option after three years of taking the rights back. And I had this crazy French guy named Guillaume Canet calling me all the time on the phone. And when it became, I promised him if it ever became open and he could match the option money, uh, which was a lot for France, um, I would I would do it. And there, yeah, everyone told me I was crazy to do it, but it was uh, it was the right move. And it was a, it's a movie that, you know, still people watch today and are still proud of today. So, um, yeah. With other novelists who've sold in enormous quantities, so people like David Baldacci, who we mentioned, but also Lee Child, we've asked them and had some really interesting answers about how their um, relationships with quote-unquote literary writers or the literary establishment works. And a sense that there can sometimes be a kind of two-way envy um, about respectability and about money. But also, Lee Child said actually he felt that the, you know, the literary writers who were really at the top of their game were very welcoming and warm to him and that it was it was kind of people lower down that who were who were difficult i mean how has that part of the piece worked for you i'm gonna agree with lee on that um you know david david foster wallace used to read me and we used to talk about it. i remember david one time at a reunion at amherst college saying to me when he's he said you know how to end the book i just keep writing like he's writing infinite chest at the time which was i don't know <laughs> over 1200 1300 pages um so I've never seen that 
Exactly. I've never seen that from successful literary writers. I've never seen that sort of envy or jealousy of the or looking down upon. I only see it from the frustrated artist, the person who thinks that I will be there if it wasn't for those damn gatekeepers or people not really understanding what a genius I am. Um, that's what, you know, the, the, the undiscovered genius of me, those people I think are always in trouble as writers, um, anyway. So I think I'll, you know, I'll agree with my, with my pal Lee, um, on that. I haven't really experienced it that much. The truth of the matter is every writer you've ever had on the, sh on your broadcast has wants two things, uh, more book sales and better reviews. That's human nature. We all want that. I know uh, Philip Roth, uh, my favorite, one of my favorite writers of all time, uh, an employee at a Barnes & Noble here in New York, he's telling me Philip Roth used to come in and turn his books face out. Philip Roth in his you know, 70s and 80s was still doing that. So he cared about sales. And he, you know, so everybody care. I, I, I hate when people pretend that they don't. That's the part that sort of drives me crazy. They you know, the, the writer who thinks they're too important or the one that says, oh, I, I'm only into character. I'm writing my favorite. I'm writing literary crime fiction. Well, that's bullshit. You're writing crime fiction or you're not. Don't give me this literary crap. What you're trying to say is I write better than everybody else. You don't. We'll see. Don't have to define it as literary. Let it come out and see how other people define it. I like that very much. Um, it's We're coming towards the end of our time, so it's a final question from me. Um, you mentioned earlier having incremental ambition and kind of constantly re readjusting what you're aiming for. I mean, now you've got, you know, 80 million, I think it is, books in print. You know, the adaptations have been watched by hundreds of millions of people worldwide. How are you adjusting your expectations or aims now? And, and you know, what, what's that kind of left to, to shoot for? What pushes me is, oh, I'm, I'm self-driven. I always, I just want to write a better book each time. I want to do a better TV show each time. That hasn't changed. You know, people will say, oh, with the success, it must be more intimidating to write. Well, no. It was more nerve wracking when I was hoping to just get another book deal or hoping to somehow make a little bit of a living. That's pressure. This is not pressure. Or as my friend Billie Jean King says, I love name dropping friend Billie Jean King, but uh, Billie Jean King says that pressure is a privilege. I love that. Pressure is a privilege. So bring it. When the new show comes out, I know Netflix has spent a lot of money on it or Amazon Prime, bring it. I can take it. I, I look forward to that and I thrive on that. And the luck, it is a privilege. The luck that I'm able to be able to do that is not something, you know, Think Twice just came out, right? And so people are going to walk into bookstores and there's thousands of books to choose from. The fact that you might choose mine is a responsibility I take really seriously. If you read it and you're disappointed, I'm bummed. It doesn't matter how much money I made off of it or whatever else. I'm, I'm disappointed in myself. I want to capture you. I want you to think, wow, I'm so glad I spent the time reading that book. And so that's always what has driven me, and that continues to drive me. I, I don't, I've never chased the dollars. I've always chased the reader's hearts. But by chasing the reader's hearts, the dollars follow. If you chase the dollars, you're going to lose them anyway. It's like trying to hold water in your hand for a long period of time. So I always want to write the best book that I can, and everything else will fall into place. And a final question from me. You signed your uh, Netflix deal in 2018, which I suppose was approaching the kind of high watermark with streamers, with excitement and investment and, and things like that. Do you sense that there's been any kind of sea change in that market in the years since? And how do you see things in that industry going forward? For me, I don't think it's changed very much. I think that we've had the success that we've had and we continue to right now. I think other there's other shows that are probably having you know, more difficulty or less difficulty um, depending on, on what they are. And these are the things I was sort of talking about before with the la, 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 I stick my fingers in my ear. I don't know. I am working on making sure every show that I do is something different and better than the one before. Um, I try my best at that. It's harder to control a, a TV series as opposed to a book, but I love the, you know, what, what's going on with them. Um, and I don't really say to myself, oh, well, streaming is in, streaming is out. This one's ABC is doing well, or this network is doing well. Um, Netflix is, is tremendous. They're, uh, they're mammoth. Their, their numbers are staggering how many people watch and care about Netflix shows. And so I'm thrilled to be part of that. I'm thrilled when I work with other networks too, but again, I, I, I have no idea, uh, what I think that's a fool's game anyway. No one ever gets it right. No one ever predicted what was going to be, what we'd be talking about, whatever we're talking about in today's news cycle. No one predicted any of this. Everyone gets it wrong. 
So I, I think it's always a, a, a foolish thing to try to predict what's going to happen. I, th I think it's a mistake as an artist or as a creator. I just have to focus on what I know best, which is telling the best story I can. If the marketplace changes and my stories are no longer relevant, hey, I gave it my best shot. But I can't fake it. I'm, I'm going to tell a story that I love, and that's the best chance I had at success. I'm not going to be able to control if streamers are going to be bigger, we're going to move back to network. I don't. I just don't know. Well, that feels like an apt note to end on, in a way. Um, <laughs> I don't know. You, That's the apt note. To you end just on. focus on what you're doing, I think, <laughs> and right. you know the rest will follow. But um, wishing you all the very best with Think Twice and your many, many other projects going forward. Thanks. It was great talking to you guys. Thank you. That was the Always Take Notes interview with Harlan Coben. He's on Twitter at Harlan Coben. He's on Instagram at Harlan Coben. His website is harlancoben.com and Think Twice is published by Century. Hello, it's us again. Rachel, what was your takeaway from the interview with Harlan? I think it was a great time to get Harlan on the show. For Me Once was all over social media. There was lots of discussion about it. And obviously he's extremely prolific at the same time. So uh, I feel like you see his books everywhere as well. Um, but beyond that, um, I just I found it a really interesting conversation, um, particularly that extraordinary crop of peers at Amherst and then the early missteps through to the Hollywood adaptations and the, and the misadventures. I particularly enjoyed the story of the executives kind of missing the point of the book entirely. Um, so yeah, I thought it was a, a wide ranging and uh, interesting conversation. How about you? Um, I also really enjoyed it. Um, in particular, his changing view on adaptation. So I liked the uh, analogy that came up um, of, you know, 20 years ago that you sold the book uh, to Hollywood and you sort of drove out in the desert, threw it over a fence and had nothing more to do with it. And this idea that Hollywood would place of destroyed writers and stuff like that and his feeling that by contrast streaming tv was a much more sympathetic ecosystem uh, that you could have more involvement in without being compromised so i thought that was very good um, i also thought just his um his kind of candor about the important role that his wife played in his career and saying that you know that she was supportive financially but also just you know she was behind the project and she had a she was a doctor she had a steady job and i thought it was um you know admirable that he was sort of open open about that um and i also think you know this is you know we've had a number of these extremely successful thriller or relatively commercial novelists on and i think they're really good guests because we try and ask them you know serious questions about their work and they tend to respond well about it and so i think it's um you know it's very good interviewing them anyway uh rachel what have you been up to and what have you been consuming uh, just to your point about spouses i think yes the the, the labor or um, the work that is often unsung. It's nice on this podcast when when people do uh, sing it, celebrate, celebrate. Yeah, <laughs> sing it, celebrate it, um, draw attention to it. So yeah, I agree. Um, what have I been up to? Um, watching the Olympics mostly. Um, that's been that's been fun. I enjoyed the is it the road biking that was quite thrilling yesterday. Um, but in terms of consuming, I've just started a book that's coming out in September by Sonia Purnell. I loved her last one, um, A Woman of No Importance, which was about um, a resistance fighter, an American woman. Um, and her new one is about um, Churchill's daughter-in-law, who became very influential um, sort of as a diplomat and in various other ways. Um, so yes, I'm looking forward to getting stuck into that. I'm enjoying it already. How about you? I finished up my stint of archival research, uh, which was good. I had a um, the last week was suddenly all in all in German because I'd crossed the linguistic boundary, um, and I had to deal with some fairly uh, pernickety librarians. But that was that was all fine. But it was uh, I'd basically had sort of four weeks solidly of, of reporting and archival stuff, so I was quite tired. And then came up to Paris where I met my girlfriend Hyun, and we saw the Olympic tennis yesterday, which was uh, like I was saying off air, like amazing to see. Um, the, the kind of sheer force with which they whack the ball, uh, which you don't get a sense of on TV, but it was um, <laughs> it was very, very hot, so quite quite challenging conditions. Um, and, and as with cultural consumption, um, I, again, mostly reading <laughs> archival documents in French and German, um, but I'm nearing the end of this book, Alpinisme Ivanao, um, and then I have another sort of weighty tome in French to read after that. So it's all... Um, it's all quite book orientated, but you know, we are making progress. Anyway, this has been Always Take Notes, hosted by me, Simon Akam. I me, Rachel Lloyd. Our producer and social media editor is Artemis Irvin. Our score is by Jess Danheiser, and our graphic design is by James Edgar. 
If you'd like to follow us on social media, we're on Twitter at Tech Notes Always. We're on Instagram at Always Tech Notes. If you'd like to support us on our crowdfunding page on Patreon, we're on there under Always Tech Notes. And if you'd like to leave a review on iTunes or get in touch with us via our website, please do. Many thanks. Goodbye.